Good Sunday morning and welcome to our class. Thank you for your interest in it. We are standing now on the very cusp of the fourth century, that means 300, and we're going to take a little time to look back today and see where we have come from and where we are, and then to look ahead a little bit. As we enter this fourth century, it is indeed a pivotal century, and many things will change. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I really hope it is an informative and interesting and encouraging uh, session for you. I do hope that what is taught is truth and certainly hope that God is glorified. So let's join our study. We're finding our roots and we are now at that pivotal fourth century. In the first part of our study today, I want us to look at the state of the church in 300 and then we're going to look a little bit at persecution, then the conversion of Constantine. So what was the status of the church by the fourth century? Right before everything changed, the doctrine, the organization, and the worship of the church. Here's some things we need to focus on. We've talked before about the organization of the church. Uh, scripture talks about elders, and at, at the very early time of the church, and even early uh, first century, second century, um, we're going to see the a, a bishop named as the leader of the elders, uh, the spokesman for the church. And as time goes on, that process will develop until we have what we call the monarchical bishop where the bishop is really in control of the church. There are still elders there, but this, this bishop is the administrator of the church. I will note that it is only for that particular church at this time, not for any other church than, other than the one that he is a member of. We're going to look at the rule of faith today in, in some detail, particularly the development of the Apostles' Creed, answering the question, what did people believe? What did Christians believe? in 300. Before we have noticed there has been a development of the New Testament canon, it is in the fourth century that that canon is defined. However, even in the second century we noticed all but seven of the 27 books of the New Testament were identified and were believed as being canonical, that is inspired. Then the liturgy of the church, let's see where it stands in 300 and we'll focus on that somewhat today. And then the spread of the gospel, how far it had spread in 300. And here are seven paths that we're following, and I put in red uh, how the five points today relate to these seven points. For instance, the rule of faith would apply to who is Christ, uh, it would apply to what must one do to be saved, to some degree it would, and then it would apply to who is God. Now, the monarchical bishop concept, which I mentioned, would address the question of what is the church. We are going to look at liturgy, and we, I mentioned the, number seven, the canon. Number five, how should the Christian live? During the 300 years thus far, we have seen this matter addressed. We noticed that it was addressed by the apologists of the second century, who are laying forth to the emperor Antoninus Pius and to other uh, leaders in, in the Roman government and even individuals, look at the way Christians live, look at the change that is effected by their faith in Christ. And that becomes in and of itself an evidence of the authenticity of the gospel. What else could produce that particular change? So let's focus on that rule of faith. That's what, that's what it's called, the rule of faith. We would say creed. And the Apostles' Creed is the earliest, the best known, and in, in a way the most definitive of the early confessions of faith. In 160, somewhere around then, 160 to 170, both in Ethiopia and in Asia Minor, we find this particular expression of that creed. And I will say that most uh, theologians, most historians believe that this creed originated as a baptismal formula in the church in Rome. Rome was 
uh, a faithful, large church quite early. And it seemed to be their custom that before a person could be baptized, they would be asked to confess their faith, and this particular form would be used. It would ask them what they believe. We believe in the Father, ruler of the universe, and in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, and in the Holy Church, and in the forgiveness of sin. That in the second century. And then from a papyrus, which dates around 200, this expression of the rule of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and in his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Spirit, and in the resurrection of the body, and in the Holy Catholic Church. And then in the church in Rome at 2.15, that baptismal formula had been somewhat uh, enlarged and took this particular form. And by the way, these statements uh, were somewhere close to 12 of them. And thus the idea of the Apostles' Creed came from the fact of, of 12 statements of faith. Actually, I count in some of them 13 and some 11. But at any rate, uh, that, that seems to be the connection to the Apostles. The Apostles certainly did not write it. Here's the, the form of the Creed in 215. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only begotten Son, our Lord who was born of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, who by Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, and the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Now, Hippolytus of Rome, about two, the same time, 215, turned that creed into uh, a somewhat, as we would say today, a, a catechism, uh, interrogatory, question form. Um, we have that in, in our uh, catechisms. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was born of the Holy Spirit from Mary the Virgin and crucified under Pontius Pilate and was dead and buried and resurrected the third day to life from death and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the body? Now, as we come into the fourth century, uh, the creed appears this way. I believe, therefore, in God the Almighty, and in Christ Jesus, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin, by Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried, and the third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of the Father, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Let's turn to the question of liturgy by the fourth century. We have noted before Justin Martyr's apology, which he dedicated to Antoninus Pius, that was defense of, of Christianity. And it is a rather lengthy uh, document, and he refers to portions of the liturgy at different parts in, uh, of that a document. So putting it together, gathering what he said from various places, it would seem that this is the liturgy. An Old Testament reading or lesson, a New Testament reading, sermon, intercessory prayers, the kiss of peace, the presentation of bread and wine, the great thanksgiving, the distribution of bread and wine by the deacons, the extended distribution to the absent, the gathering, and the giving of tithes and offerings. Now, other uh, theologians have uh, put together uh, what would be the liturgy by the, by the fourth century. This is taken from, from various uh, liturgies, and it would seem it followed this general pattern. First, the liturgy of the word, 
in which they would begin with private prayers. And then there would be the singing of psalms interspersed with scripture readings, uh, lessons. And also there would be scripture readings, lessons from the gospels. Alleluia's, a sermon or sermons. If it was one sermon, it would be by the bishop. If it were more than one, the bishop would preach and then one or more of the elders. Deacons would speak to the catechumens and to the penitents, and there would be a dismissal of all but the faithful. Thus, the liturgy of the word, open to all, would then be followed by the liturgy of the upper room or the liturgy of the table. And this is closed to those who are not yet baptized. Uh, thus, their way of <laughs> fencing the table. The deacons would speak to the faithful. It would be a kiss of peace, an offertory, thus a collection of alms. It would be the presentation and preparation of the elements, the Lord's Supper, a prayer, the Sanctus, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the Lord's Prayer, thanksgiving, then the words of institution from scripture. It would be prayer, communion taken in both kinds, both the bread and the cup. The bread would be broken, elevated, and taken. Each communicant would then respond with amen. Psalms were sung during the communion, and there would be a post-communion thanksgiving, and bread would be taken away to the sick and absent, followed by a dismissal, a benediction. Did they sing? Of course they did. And we do have some hymns of the early church, and these are up to and including the fourth century. Of course, we have uh, the lyrics, the words. We don't have the music that came later. These uh, selections you will see came from the Trinity hymnal. The earliest one I could find dates from 200 and was written apparently by Clement of Alexandria, whom we studied last week. Shepherd of tender youth, guiding in love and truth. And then one by Ambrose. Ambrose was fourth century. He was the Bishop of Milan, and he was also a great hymn writer. Early hymns uh, that he wrote are known as Ambrosian hymns. They were quite popular. Then Gregory the Great came along with the Gregorian chants. But here is an Ambrosian hymn, O Splendor of God's Glory Bright, from Light Eternal Bringing Light. Gregory of Nancianus, also fourth century from the East, wrote this hymn, O Light That Knew No Dawn, That Shines to Endless Day. And the Te Deum, one that we have sung in our church, uh, holy God, we praise your name. Lord of all, we bow before you. All on earth your scepter claim. This, again, dates from the fourth century, this particular form from later in the 18th century. And uh, this hymn, All Glory Be to Thee Most High, uh, was from the fourth century as well. Let's look now at the growth of the church as we stand at uh, 300 and begin to look over into the fourth century evangelization during this time. And I want you to notice first the red in this particular slide. By 300, approximately 10% of the population of the Roman Empire were converted to Christ. And they were converted before there were missionaries, before there was a possibility for the church freely to send out uh, preachers to declare the word. So how were they converted? Ramsey McMullen claims that these people were converted by personal contact, simply by Christians sharing the gospel with their friends and their family and their neighbors. And thus the gospel spread tremendously in the first 300 years. But beginning at 300 into the fourth century, we're going to see these missionaries going out for instance, in Gregory the Illuminator, otherwise known as Gregory the Wonder Worker, into Armenia, Brumentius into Ethiopia, very possibly building on the earlier work of the Ethiopian eunuch. And then there's a Celtic church existing up in the north part of England, in Wales and Scotland and Ireland, 
this Celtic church was an organized, functioning church before the Roman Catholic Church existed. But the thing is, we don't know who established this Celtic church. We know that it was prospering, it was flourishing. There is one particular monk who comes to attention, a man named Pelagius, about whom we shall talk, and he's first uh, comes into four and into uh, consideration at the Council of Arles in 314. The Germans, the Goths, we have a missionary, Ulfilus, Little Wolf, working among them. And in France, among the Gauls, Martin of Tours in the fourth century. So all of these, these missionaries are fourth century, and they work, of course, at a time when the persecution is lifted. Here's a map that shows that spread of the church. This map extends up to 600. So we're looking at a period of time into the fourth century, but the, the period prior to the fourth century, that is up to 300, is indicated in this map by the darker color. And so you can see uh, the area around Jerusalem and you see into Asia Minor and around Carthage and North Africa uh, and, and Italy. So it's not as widely spread as it was, but remember that's 10% and that's spread by personal uh, testimonies and evangelism. Then the fourth century, remember, was the area of Ar Armenia and Egypt, south of Egypt into Ethiopia, uh, into the Germanic area, uh, Gaul, and of course the Celtic church. Now, I realized I said at the beginning of this study, I want to stay away from politics, uh, try to keep focus on the theological development and not in the uh, political. However, you can't avoid it because there's a definite uh, intersection of the politics of Rome with the church, and that happened in the early fourth century. And I, I call this persecution that turned to protection, but some people doubt that it was a good thing. I'll let you decide for yourself. First of all, persecution. Let's take a look at the persecution of Rome uh, during a period of time prior to the conversion of Constantine. First known persecution by a Roman emperor was of course the infamous Nero, who ruled between 54 and 68. Now, Nero started out as being a fairly good emperor, but uh, he became rather unhinged as time went on. In 64, at the time he was becoming quite unpopular, there was a fire that destroyed a good part of Rome and uh, people passed around the gossip and the rumor that he was seen, uh, his uh, figure illuminated by the fire, uh, playing on a lyre on Palatine Hill in his palace. That probably is apocryphal because Nero very likely was out of town and he was quite appalled by this fire, although he took advantage of it to uh, build his a golden house on the ruins, but he was being blamed for the fire, so he needed to take the focus off himself, and he found a convenient scapegoat in the Christians, and so he ac accused them of setting the fire, uh, and he persecuted them. This was a persecution that was localized. It was in Rome, but it was terrible. He would bring them into his racetrack. He had a racetrack at Vatican, Vatican Hill, and uh, there he would dress them in uh, lamb's skins because he said they claimed to follow uh, the lamb of God. And he would throw them to these wild animals who would just tear them limb from limb. Uh, he tied them to posts in, in the racetrack and uh, poured pitch over them and set them on fire because he said they claimed to be the light of the world. And he made them the light of what would be a garden party there. So we know that he persecuted Christians in his circus. Here you see a drawing of Nero's circus at the Vatican. Uh, it was built originally by the Gaius, uh, Caligula, and then Nero. You see the, the center is called the Spina, and there's an obelisk there. All obelisks in Rome, and there are many, were brought from Egypt by the first emperor, Augustus, after his victory over Mark Antony and Cleopatra in 31 BC. 
This particular obelisk sits in the center of this racetrack and the chariots would, would race around it. So this is the site of the persecution of Christians under Nero. Traditionally, Peter was martyred there. Now here's another view of it from the model. There's a, a huge model of all of Rome in the Museum of Roman Civilization in EUR in Rome. Uh, you see a, a circular building there, which I assume was for judges to be able to see uh, the chariots and be able to determine who, who won. But you see that obelisk standing in the middle of Nero's racetrack. Now, at this time, we move forward. This is after the conversion of Constantine when he built a church on this site to commemorate Peter, supposedly Peter being martyred there. So he calls this church St. Peter's. It's old St. Peter's. It no longer stands. And in this uh, picture, you see the obelisk. If you look to the center left of the church, you'll see that round building that we saw in the earlier picture, and you see the obelisk. That's where it was at the time this church was built. But let's move forward. This is where it is today. You can still see that obelisk. It was moved from where it was and placed in the center of St. Peter's Square when the new St. Peter's was built in the 16th century. And uh, the square was designed by Bernini, a great uh, Baroque uh, architect. Actually, I took this picture, uh, climbed to the top of the dome of St. Peter's, something I will not do again. But here's the picture to prove I was there. Uh, those apostles you see, we consider on the roof of St. Peter's, you look way up to them. I'm far above that, 450 feet up above St. Peter's Square. But that's the original obelisk. The next known persecution is by Domitian, who ruled between 81 and 96. His father Vespasian followed uh, uh, Nero after uh, intermission of uh, four emperors and uh, restored order. Um, his father was the one who destroyed Jerusalem and his brother, the general in charge, Domitian's the younger brother who takes over in 81, who does have some, uh, let us say, mental instability. And supposedly he's the one who exiled John to the island of Patmos and persecuted other Christians. We don't really know why. We come now to Trajan. After Domitian's death in 96, we have five emperors known as the Antonines. Sometimes they're called good emperors. It's the high point of Roman civilization. And the second of them was Trajan. Uh, we have a letter uh, between him and his governor of Bithynia, Pliny. Pliny wrote to Trajan and explained to him, among other things, what his policy was regarding the Christians. And he said, I don't go out and seek them, but if someone accuses a person of being a Christian, and you know what the accusations were, sometimes atheism or incest or cannibalism or some such thing as that, and if someone is accused, then I will bring them in and I will interrogate them and I will ask them to revile Christ and to offer incense to your image. And if they don't do that, I will put them to death. If they do it, then I will release them. Is that acceptable? And Trajan said, yes. So we assume that is a policy that was followed under Trajan. And there were some people put to death under Trajan, such as Clement of Rome. Now let's come down to Decius. We're skipping a good deal of time. Uh, let me fill you in as to what happened. The last of these Antonines or good emperors was Marcus Aurelius, who died in 180. And following that, we have a military dynasty, the Severans. Uh, after they ended in 235, everything collapsed. The government collapsed. The military was on the verge of collapse. The economy collapsed. There was chaos in the empire and Rome was threatened by uh, enemies on all sides, it seems like, on the east, particularly by the Persians, and on the west um, by the, the Germans, and it was a dangerous time. Rome was vulnerable, and it is in this time, in times like this, that Rome would resort to persecution. There, there's a definite correlation between the persecution of Christians 
and a condition of Roman weakness and vulnerability. The reason for that is obvious. When Rome is weak, they must demand unconditional loyalty to the state and thus to its leader who is the emperor and who claims to be a god. For Christians, loyalty is certainly possible. They were loyal citizens of the empire. But as far as worshiping the emperor as a god, they could not do that conscientiously. Thus the persecution. And this emperor who ruled between 249 and 250, in the year 250, instituted an empire-wide persecution of Christians. Every Christian was subject to arrest and to death unless they recanted. Now that persecution will continue. Uh, it will continue from that period of time until uh, the time of Diocletian and including Diocletian. But I mentioned Diocletian because he comes to power in 285. It had been 50 years since the collapse of the Roman government. And during that time, there were 26 different emperors and only uh, two of them died a natural death. You see the chaos. Diocletian, who came from what is now Croatia, brought about a restabilization of the empire. He created a, a, a new economic system, military system, political system. Uh, he did bring order out of chaos. He divided the empire into four parts and had four different rulers in order to control it. But he did continue the persecution against the Christians. He considered them to be a threat. However, he focused particularly on the clergy and he required the clergy to hand over all of their copies of scripture. That seemed to be really what he was concerned most about, uh, stopping Christianity by eliminating the clergy. He imprisoned them and, and forced them to turn over all of their literature, particularly the scriptures. Just bear that in mind for what we're talking about next week. But he did continue the persecution. Now he will finally retire in 305, and he was succeeded by uh, their four emperors continuing this, this, what we call a tetrarchy, and one of them, one of the most powerful ones, and I know this is a very strange looking image, it's the best one I could find of Galerius, Galerius 305 to 311, and he continued this severe persecution. However, in 311, he became very ill. And that fact was known to the Christians. And they did exactly what our Lord taught us to do in such a situation. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Galerius was their enemy, of course, and they prayed for him. And that prayer was written down, and somehow it found its way to Galerius. When Galerius read the prayer, he said, I cannot continue to persecute people who pray for me. So he lifted the persecution, and in 311, by the Edict of Toleration, persecution once and for all ended against Christians. After Galerius' death, uh, the empire would have really three emperors. One of them had died along with Galerius, so there were three. And, uh, up in the north, there was Constantine who succeeded his father. His father was one of the four emperors under Diocletian, Constantius. And he had died in 306, and his son Constantine had taken over. In Italy and in Gaul, the emperor was Maxentius. And then in the east, the emperor was Licinus. So there were three of them. But Constantine had the goal in mind of restoring the monarchy that is, eliminating his two rivals and instituting himself as the one and only emperor of Rome. So in the year 312, he advanced on Rome to encounter his enemy, Maxentius. And something happened. And in 313, he will make Christianity a legal religion. Something happened just before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. But before we come to that, let's look at worship in the city of Rome in particular, because Rome, of course, is the capital. But let's look at what we can find out about worship in Rome before the time of Constantine. 
in the days of persecution. Now, we've noticed before the Church of, of Santa Prisca. <clears throat> this was thought to be the location of the house of Priscilla and Aquila. You recall that, that Paul wrote uh, in his Roman letter <clears throat> to greet the Priscilla and Aquila and the church that is in their house. Now, excavations under the church show some interesting things. Let me just add <clears throat> that under the city of Rome today is an entirely different world, an earlier world that's covered up and it's fascinating. And archeologists are continuing to find things, to find even buildings that are intact or partially intact <clears throat> under the Rome of today. And they found under Santa Prisca, a Mithraeum, such as we also find <clears throat> under San Clemente. I'll come to a picture of that again in a moment. There are also houses under there with evidence of Christian worship. Now these houses were connected to each other, somewhat we'd say like apartments or condominiums. And Ramsey McMullen claims that there's evidence from what was found in these houses <clears throat> that both Christians and pagans were living next door to each other. Now it is entirely possible that among the people who lived in that condominium were Priscilla and Aquila and then others living there. The point McMullen is making is that Christians and pagans lived peacefully side by side without a problem at that time. Another early church is the Basilica of Santa Prudenziana. <clears throat> this is one of the oldest places of Christian worship in Rome. Uh, it was erected over a second century house which was thought to belong to Senator Pudens. Uh, and, and it was built, it seems, about 140, 155 during that time of, of Senator Pudens. Was Pudens the same Pudens that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 4 in verse 21, he was writing from Rome to Timothy and he mentions Pudens being associated with him. That is possible. Or it is possible that that Pudens was the father of the Senator Pudens. In any instance, Pudens was a Christian and this was his house. And this structure became, after the conversion of Constantine, a church, but before the conversion of uh, Constantine, it was the residence of the Bishop of Rome. But at that time, Constantine offered his Lateran palace to that bishop in its stead. There's some rumor that it was built over a bathhouse that is not confirmed. And I have to be a little bit careful about what, what I say here because archaeology continually, uh, archaeologists revise their, their findings. Uh, it's not sure that it was built over a bathhouse. It's a region where there were numerous bathhouses. There were actually um, 117 bathhouses in Rome at this time. Now, underneath Rome were the catacombs. People could not be buried in the city, so they were buried outside of the city, and these catacombs were tunnels dug all the way around, circumscribing Rome, so you could just completely walk all around the city of, of Rome in, underground. It was safe for the Christians to go down there because the Roman soldiers were superstitious and they did not dare to go down there. They thought there were ghosts. They didn't want to be around dead bodies. And so the Christians buried their dead. You see these shelves in the catacombs. They would place their bodies there. Of course, they'd be covered over um, by a, a door, a covering. Also, there are chapels throughout the catacombs where Christians would worship. As a matter of fact, we've had, our groups have had worship services in the catacombs, and you'll find some of the earliest Christian art there. So it, it served many purposes. But a very safe place to hide, to worship, to bury dead, and to uh, commemorate Christ by art. We looked at this before. These are the houses that are under the Church of San Clemente, the church that is there today honoring Clement of Rome, the fourth level. This would give you an idea of what the church, the houses would look like under Santa Prisca. You see rooms joined together. And uh, this is underneath a Mithraeum. 
and there was a Mithraeum also on top of the level of houses under Santa Prisca. Uh, Mithra was made the official religion of uh, the empire by Diocletian. And that was a, a serious rival of Christianity. And uh, I suggested, as we looked at this before, that perhaps the Mithraeum was built on top of these houses that were known places where Christians lived and probably worshiped in their houses as a sign of their triumph over Christianity. And then when Constantine made Christianity a legal religion, this church honoring uh, Clement of Rome, San Clemente, was built on top of the uh, Mithraeum. Now, from persecution to protection, what happened? Well, we left Constantine advancing to Rome, and he's going to encounter his enemy, the other emperor, Maxentius. And that meeting and that uh, battle will take place just outside Rome at Milvian Bridge. But just before the battle, Constantine saw a vision in the sky. He saw the vision of the key row, which is called the Labarum. It is the first two Greek letters in the word Christ, Christos. And he saw emblazoned above that Labarum, he saw these Latin words in hoc signo wind case, which means in this sign you will conquer. And when he saw that, he thought this is a message from a God, uh, that God being Christ, and it would be unwise for me to ignore it. So he commanded his soldiers to inscribe this labarum on their shields. They went into the shield, into the battle with that on their shields, and they won. Maxentius was defeated and he died. Later, Constantine would conquer his other rival, uh, and Lysinus in 323, and he would be the only emperor. Now, the sources for this are Lactantius, who is a very early Christian historian and a very reliable historian, and Eusebius, who also is an early Christian historian and considered to be reliable, biographer of Constantine. Both of these historians mention this incident, so there's good reason to believe that it is true. Now, Constantine came to believe that Christ is not only real, he is God, at least a God, and he is a source of power, and therefore a source of power for him. Now, it, one of the great responsibilities of a Roman emperor is to be Pontifex Maximus, PM, Pontifex Maximus, high priest. Their responsibility is to maintain the Pax Deorum. In the early days of the Roman Republic, the high priest would inform the consul if they could go to battle because they would check with the gods to see if the signs were favorable to go into battle. You don't want to go against the will of the gods. That would mean defeat. So they always checked with the Pontifex Maximus. But beginning with Julius Caesar, the leaders of Rome took that title to themselves, and therefore they had the prerogative of determining the Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods, and they would thus make the decisions as to when to go to battle or anything else important. Now their goal is to maintain, if possible, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. That peace began with Augustus back in 31 BC because they'd been through a period of war, and for 200 years, there was peace in the Roman Empire until the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180. But as we've seen, there was chaos in the Roman state, and that chaos was just now coming to an end. Therefore, the goal that, that Constantine had, and especially by becoming the one and only emperor, would be to return to the Pax Romana. But now he could accomplish that not by maintaining the peace of the gods, in which he no longer believed, but now the, this new God in whom he believes, Christ, and so he has to maintain the Pax Christi. He may, has to make sure that Christ is pleased. Now I am stressing this point so that you can understand why the government would take over the management, the administration of the church. 
why would they involve themselves in this in this way? Because they had the responsibility of maintaining the Pax Christi and thus the Pax Romana. They had that responsibility as the high priest, as the Pontifex Maximus. And when we come to the ecumenical councils, you can understand why it is Constantine who calls these first councils and subsequent emperors will do so. Here's a painting of Constantine at Milvian Bridge. Uh, they are going to show an actual cross up there, but from the sources, what he saw is what you see to the right, the labarum, the key row. And this is a picture of the Milvian Bridge in Rome. Uh, I did go there and took a picture. This is not mine, it's better than mine. But there are, uh, I'm told, two of these spans that are original. This is where the battle took place. And apparently, uh, Maxentius died by falling or being thrown into the river. Now, the first church that was built once the persecution ended was the church of Santa Maria and Trastevere. That means across the Tiber in a poor area of Rome. This is the church as it appears today, uh, but parts of it are original. Christians had started building a church in 221 and we're building up to 227, but persecution caused them to destroy it because the during the days of intense persecution, all Christian uh, places of worship were destroyed. But after the persecution ended, it was then rebuilt in 340. Santa Maria in Trastevere marks the place where Christians uh, built their first church building for the purpose of worship. And then Constantine built four basilica churches to honor Christ at the four corners of the city of Rome. St. Peter's, where Peter presumably was martyred. St. Paul's, where Paul presumably was martyred. Santa Croce, to house a piece of the cross, the cross piece supposedly, that his mother Helena brought back from Jerusalem. And the Church of the Redeemer, now known as St. John Lateran. That was to house the stairway that his mother brought back, supposedly uh, the stairway from the Castle Antonia at, uh, at, at the temple site um, where Jesus was um, crucified or was judged by Peter, by, by Pilate, excuse me. This is the image we saw before, St. Peter's, the old St. Peter's, that uh, now is gone, and that's the position of the obelisk. This is the church of St. Paul's outside the walls. It is supposedly the place where Paul was beheaded. And you see this uh, marker that was found that says Paul, apostle and martyr, thus indicating the site. This church, the original church burned in 1832, but was rebuilt apparently exactly as Constantine had originally built it. This is uh, Santa Croce in Jerusalem. It is the church that was built to house the relics that his mother Helena brought back from Jerusalem. And finally, uh, the Church of the Redeemer, which is now St. John Lateran. Uh, that is the place, this is the Lateran Palace you see off to the, the right, the um, yellow colored building, orange colored. Um, that's the Lateran Palace. And that is the place, not the original building, a new one since then, but that's the place that, that Constantine gave to the Bishop of Rome after Constantine's conversion. And that's where this, the papacy would be centered until they moved to the Vatican in the 16th century. Now this supposedly are, would be the stairway at the Castle Antonia in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, whether it is the real one or not, it, it is claimed that it is, and Helena brought it back. Uh, that Jesus went down these uh, steps uh, to be beaten by the soldiers, back up the steps uh, to be judged by Pilate, and again down to go off to be crucified. And so that is why pilgrims go up on their knees saying, Hail Mary's and our fathers on every step. Uh, Luther did that, but said it didn't do him any good. And at St. John Lateran, there's another obelisk. Remember, all obelisks came from uh, Egypt by Augustus, and this commemorates uh, Constantine's baptism by Bishop Stephen II. He was baptized just before his death in 337. And uh, then you see behind it the baptistry building, which is original, has not been changed. 
And the reason there were separate baptistry buildings is that people could not enter the sanctuary until they were baptized. Constantine also built this uh, building as a tomb for his sister Costanza. I show it because it is in its original condition. And it also contains some of the best uh, early Christian mosaics, as you see here. Now, what did this Constantinian shift mean? Before 313, the church governed itself with bishops taking the lead. The fathers whom we studied, the first century, second century, and third century fathers, became the theological leaders. Often they were also bishops. And Christians, as far as the government was concerned, were often persecuted by the government. But after 313, the church was governed by the emperor. And theology was directed by the emperor, by the government, particularly through the councils. So Christians were first protected under Galerius, legalized under Constantine, and finally made the only legal religion in 381 under Theodosius I. And then the whole situation reversed. Pagans then were persecuted. Yet the church survived. 300 years without any government help. And then even after that, the gospel will continue to spread, although in a different situation. Next week, we shall come to another uh, important aspect of the pivotal fourth century, the heresies of Donatism and Arianism that result in the councils of Arles and Nicaea that are called by the Emperor Constantine. So thank you for joining us in our class today. Hope you uh, uh, enjoyed it. I hope it was informative and I hope you'll be back next week. And I hope you have a blessed week and certainly ask that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all.